Hello, everyone. So, uh, yeah, the title of my talk uh, and what I'll be focusing on is about the challenges of centrally funded open access from the perspective of a smaller publisher. And smaller publisher is probably not the right way of describing it. Um, pure open access publisher or predominantly open access publisher is probably a better fit, but that's the title I submitted, so I'm going with it. Uh, I'm going to start with an important disclaimer because, as Stuart mentioned, I've got a couple of roles that I often speak sort of in, in various capacities on, one of which is president of OAS, but that's not what I'm doing today. Um, the things that I'm about to say are in no way endorsed by, approved by, representative of OASPA's views on anything. Um, mostly what I'm saying is Paul speaking as Paul, a little bit Paul speaking on behalf of Hindawi, but certainly don't attribute any of this to OASPA. So, OA offsetting deals. Uh, I think this is uh, something that is an interesting trend that's been happening over the past uh, few years, and I think uh, people are starting to be aware of its impacts positively, negatively. And it's something that I've really only started paying a lot of attention to over the past five, six months, but I think it's, it's something that we really need to, to put front and center in, in the, the discussion of how we move forward. So what's actually been happening? Um, at the moment, uh, there's some of these deals that have happened, uh, predominantly so. In the UK, you've got Just Collections, has reached agreements with Wiley, TNF, IOP, Sage, Springer Nature. In Austria, there's deals in place with Taylor & Francis, IOP, Springer Nature. In the Netherlands, there's deals with Wiley, Springer Nature, Elsevier. So these are things that are happening, and TNF. So I'm sure these are, uh, I, the things that I'm not qualified to assert myself, I tend to put little references on, so if they're wrong, go blame them. <laughs> so basically, these things are happening. And uh, describing exactly what these things are is quite difficult, both because each one is different from the, the next. Uh, I think none of these deals look like another one of these deals. They all have slightly different models. Some of them you're getting Universities are getting coupons that they can use on things or discounts or everything's all bundled together. And apart from it being hard to describe because of the variety, they're hard to describe because they're not public. You don't really know. Um, many of these things are covered by NDAs and the only things you hear are things that kind of leak out through the grapevine. So it's hard to understand exactly what's happening. Then OA 2020 is something different. And so I, I spoke on a similar sort of topic a few months back at the OA 2020 meeting. And there I focus very much on OA 2020's mission and agenda. And I want to be clear, this is not an OA 2020 thing. I think these deals that have been signed uh, are happening and they're not coordinated or managed by OA 2020. But I think the vision that OA 2020 has put up is a useful one. And so these are a few of the things from their, uh, from their website. The aim is to transition or transform a majority of today's journals from subscription to OA publishing, and at the same time continuing to support new and improved forms of OA publishing. They plan on pursuing this by a transformational process in converting resources that are currently being spent on journals into funds to support OA business models. And they plan on reorganizing the underlying cash flows, establishing transparency, and adopting mechanisms to avoid undue publication barriers. And I think this is a, an excellent mission. I think this is really how we should be thinking about this transition happening. The bit of it that I think has gotten the most attention, though, is this transitioning subscription journals to open access. And I think that's where a lot of the focus at the university level, at the uh, country level, at the funder level has been focused. Because it's in some ways, it's a challenging conversation, but it's, it's a little bit easier than solving the bigger problem of sustainable um, models that are inclusive uh, to smaller publishers. If you're already in a, a subscription negotiation with a big publisher, it's achievable to tack on some open access provisions into that and figure out how that looks with a particular publisher. From the publisher's perspective, it also avoids massive disruption. I mean, you're more or less retaining a revenue stream there are risks that come with it, and I, I, I appreciate the risks that the publishers are engaging in, in in entering into these deals, but it's not massively disruptive. Um, you're getting about the same amount of money from about the same customers and providing about the same service. So I think that's why there's been momentum building behind this. But I think the end point of that path is, is not something that any of us would say is, is a real achievement. The end point is a model that has 
really entrenched a few large publishers who are in a position to negotiate those sorts of deals. I think it makes uh, any sort of innovation or cost reduction almost impossible. And uh, I, I think it also just creates a, a, a complex framework where the only thing better than the current system that is in place is that you've got open access, but all the other things that open access was meant to fix don't get fixed. So if you look, one of the things that uh, is sort of separate but related to these offsetting deals is just institutional funds that universities are spending on open access. And the best data I could find was coming out of the UK and just did some studies. In 2016, 27% of institutional OA funds went to pay for APCs and open access journals, fully OA journals. The rest went to hybrid journals. Moreover, this revenue doesn't include APCs that were paid for as part of an offsetting deal because those amounts are unknown or accounted for separately. So the real amount of money that institutions are spending on fully open access journals is a small fraction. I mean, we're talking maybe less than 15, 20% of the money that's going into the system. And, you know, I, again, I don't think that any of the people either putting this money in or advocating for open access envisioned a world where 80, 90% of the money going into the system is going into paying for hybrid. And in terms of how the money's being spent, the top 10 publishers make up 77% of the market. And again, that would be skewed even more, I'm sure, if you include the offsetting deals. This is a graph OASPA uh, released uh, as part of our, an annual thing we published uh, looking at the output of our members. And the line at the top there is basically all of the OA output of all of the OASPA members, including both fully open access journals and hybrid journals. The yellow line just below it is the fully open access journals. And you could see that in the past, there was this sort of very nice hockey stick curve of fully open access output. And then a couple of years ago, it started leveling off. But where you see really continuing is, is the combined number with the hybrids. And this is not the full story, because most of, or a large part of the hybrid is happening in publishers that are not OASPA members, so they're not included there. There's no Elsevier, there's no ACS, there's no IEEE in these numbers. So if you actually look at the impact of hybrid, again, I think you would see a massive line going up, but a big leveling off of the pure, pure OA publishers. Now, why is this a problem? I mean, isn't the whole point to get open access? Isn't that big, steep curve uh, an open access, um, you know, mission achieved? We've done our job. And I think, you know, there is an argument that, yeah, that's all we're trying to achieve. But first, this makes fully OA journals much less attractive than hybrid for authors. If in the past, a publisher like PLOS, Hindawi, Biomed Central, they can make a value proposition to authors and funders and, and basically say, yes, you need to pay a publication charge, but you're getting something out of it. You're getting free reuse, free dissemination, CC by license, and so you should, you know, th there's things you're getting for your money. But as these deals pro proliferate, they say, but I get the same thing by publishing in my favorite old journal that, you know, is a subscription title, but my article's open access, and I'm getting all the same benefits, and it's free. Nobody's, you know, I'm not paying for it, so it's free to me at least. And so I think that this not only isn't helping open access publishers, it's actively hurting our ability to, com to compete in the marketplace. There's also no evidence that it's going to move the world towards full open access. I mean, I think the, the idea of hybrid is that it was some sort of transitional model, and I think publishers are somewhat sincere in saying that if there was enough hybrid, then you would sort of transition to fully open access uh, outputs. But I think for a whole lot of reasons, that hasn't happened and that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. So I think, you know, if, if we continue this sort of funding, we're likely to live in this mixed world where you have a lot of money going into hybrid, but you have a lot of money going to subscriptions. And if open access journals, pure open access journals need funding, they have to go somewhere else to get it. And that's going to be harder and harder to find. Now, why is that a problem? So one of them uh, is cost. So in the same just study, it's reported that the median article processing charge in a fully OA journal was 1,260 pounds, while the median APC in a hybrid journal was over 2,000 pounds. So certainly on a cost basis, it's a lot more expensive to publish in hybrid journals. And the Wellcome Trust had a similar report showing similar sorts of numbers. Then in terms of transparency, pay payments for hybrid OA, particularly as part of these offsetting deals, provide very little transparency with regard to cost. And you know, as OA 2020 really articulated, a, a big part of what we need here is transparency. And it's, it's just not healthy to be in a scenario where I can't 
get slides that show how much money is being spent on open access because it's happening behind NDAs and contracts and, and things like that. And you know, I think a, apart from me not being able to make slides, there's actually real implications for, for having all the secrecy of the system. Compliance, reporting, identification of OA content is a lot more difficult in hybrid than for OA journals. I mean, any of the interesting third parties that want to do stuff with OA content, it's a lot easier to say, you know, if you come to Kindawi or PLOS or something, you can just take all of our content and do whatever you want with it because it's all CC BY. If there's a few little articles floating around on a, a Science Direct or some other subscription publishing website, it's really challenging. And I think there are anecdotal cases all over the place where things weren't tagged properly or, you know, there's just the hybrid thing didn't work. And it didn't work because it wasn't built to work. It was, I think publishers are trying, this is not through any fault of their own, but they were tacking on hybrid to an existing pipeline and, and production process and technology that wasn't built to support open access publishing. And again, hybrid and offsetting deals are further entrenching the powers of the, the largest publishers. And I think uh, one of the goals 10 years ago when OASPA was started, one of the things we really felt was Open access is going to create a more competitive marketplace where publishers compete on price, service, quality, and there aren't these massive barriers to entry. And I think the barriers to entry in a world with offsetting and hybrid is actually worse than in the subscription world because you really need to be of a certain size uh, to go negotiate these deals. And you know, to be honest, even the, the big OA publishers, the, the PLOSs, BMCs, and Nowies of this world, we're too small to negotiate these deals. We try to have conversations with countries and institutions, and there's very few of them that will engage with us. So I think you know, this really is making an anti-competitive uh, landscape for, for innovation and competition. So that's the problem. What's the, what's the solution? And um, you know, I don't think I have an actual solution, but I have some ideas. One is that where there is institutional and country level will to support open access, that pure open access journals are considered as a first class citizen and that potentially we are the first priority and that hybrid takes a, a back seat. And I understand that's challenging. Um, if you're already spending X million dollars on a subscription deal and that deal can then be converted into an open access deal, there's no new money you're putting in. And so it's gonna be hard on the institutions. I think to carve out money from subscription spending, which is what OA 2020 proposes, is that you reallocate money you need to reallocate it not to the same party at the other end of the contract. You're not reallocating subscription money spent on Elsevier to OA money spent on Elsevier. You're reallocating it to other publishers. I think transparency needs to be basically a given. And I think uh, any of these deals to have NDAs, to not have public reporting of any of these contracts, to not have you know, the funders being able to talk about what they paid for and know what they paid for, that's just not gonna work. We need, we need transparency. If there are institutional funds, uh, and I sort of mean at the university level, they need to be known to authors, they need to be well-funded, they need to be you know, really working better. And again, I understand there's institutional challenges there. The universities are not set up to be pots of money that researchers go tap into when needed. That's not what they were created for. And so they'll, there's a lot of work to be done. But I think that's very important because you're not going to get negotiated deals between every university and every little new player that comes on the market. There needs to be ad hoc money that researchers can tap into somehow. And then more radically, just no more offsetting deals and potentially no more hybrid. I think uh, if, you know, if you want to really make this change happen, um, it's not happening clearly in, in my view with, with these deals. And uh, so I don't see what the point of these, these offsetting deals are. I think it's, it's making the system worse. It's, creating open access, but in a really unhealthy way, and the end output is not gonna be really much better than what we have today. Um, you know, if it's just about access, SciHub provides that access. What we wanted was a, a scholarly publication system that's just better than what we have, and I don't think we're gonna get there through these sort of uh, centralized deals. That's it. Great. Thanks a lot for the introduction. You saved me, saved me some time there. I don't have to in introduce myself, but first of all, thanks a lot for uh, accepting me here, inviting me to give a talk. Uh, I'm very happy to, I I'm not the only researcher here, but one of the few who aren't a stakeholder representing an organization, so I can be a bit of a loose gun here. and uh, don't have anyone uh, getting angry for what I say, but um, I don't have a solution for the APC uh, kind of competitiveness problem or, or anything like that, sadly. Um, my material for today is mostly descriptive, showing you some of the ongoing uh, data that I've collected regarding 
uh, the current state and the historical development of uh, journals indexed in Scopus. So basically, a health check for open access publishing in comparison to, to subscription journals. This was basically already mentioned. I'm health researcher, health advocate, and uh, <clears throat> I've been collaborating a lot with Professor Buchrister Björk, who is also at Hanken, and he uh, supervised my doctoral thesis, which was about um, bibliometric measurement combined with web metrics and business model considerations about open access. Uh, if you're interested in that, the link is here. And I forgot to mention that I tweeted out the link to my slides, and they are also available on my homepage, firstnamelastname.com, for all the small details found in the, the visuals soon to come. I also have a disclaimer in that I <clears throat> set the title for my presentation. I guess it was early summer, and I was hopeful that I would spend most of the summer collecting data solely for this purpose, and I did manage to come almost to the finish line, but there's still, I'd say, 1% of a kind of moving, moving space to kind of clean up some of the exceptions in how journals have converted to open access, and also with regards to pricing. So it's a, a messy field uh, to try to standardize and put together into a, a simple analysis. But we're working together with Buchrister Björk to kind of put the analysis I'm now presenting with more things added into a publication that will be submitted soon enough. But all feedback you might have, uh, practical, theoretical, or criticism, please send it my way. I'm happy to hear you know, what are interesting questions that could be answered by the data we've collected. Uh, background. I'm often asked about what the state of open access is. Like, how's it doing? You know, I, I should know because I've, I've written about it but I'm not the expert in the field, uh, not currently. There are two masterpieces on kind of the health and state of open access as it exists today. One of those is published as a free ebook by Walt Crawford, where he <clears throat> personally went through each and every uh, journal web page of journals included in the directory of open access journals and recorded APC amounts as well as article counts for each and every journal with a lots of other stuff. And there's hundreds of pages of uh, tables, diagrams, and uh, interesting analysis found in that. And I think it's an underappreciated gem uh, <clears throat> that, that should get more attention. So I think that's a good benchmark for looking at kind of the top-down perspective on journals, having a, a list of journals like the DOAJ and looking how uh, journals within that index are doing based, based on that information. Then the other gem that was recently published is, is currently in preprint uh, version by Heather Pivovar and, and her team, where they did more of a bottom-up exploration based on Crossref DOIs and the OA DOI uh, API interface. So the methodology is complicated, but they use a sample of around 300,000 article references and figure out in a fairly automated fashion if they are available on the web or not. So that's not a journal-centric study, but it's, it shows different perspectives on how accessible resources that, or articles that people are interested in are accessible, how, how well they are retrievable if they are recent, or, and then also a random sample of articles. So I think these two are, are very good buddies in, in helping anyone understand how open access is doing currently. But then something that kind of came up a few years ago when uh, I, Buchrister Björk, and Professor David Solomon uh, got hired by the Harvard Library to do a report on journal conversions. So <clears throat> I'm very interested in trying to kind of map out some of the best practices, um, historical records, and kind of the success rate, and what, what journals can expect when they flip to open access. And, with regards to that, I only have this self-citation to throw on the table. There's anecdotal evidence in forms of editorials, which we tried to collect into this report, but there hasn't really been anything on a bibliometric scale trying to look at trends within research disciplines, and particularly, I think, the APC behavior of converted journals. You know, what's the pricing levels, and can we see any, any patterns going on? So we don't really know a lot about journal conversions, and that's something I'd, I'd like to explore during my talk today. 
So, we don't know a lot of things, but we know something. And <clears throat> the idea is that this study we are now working on would provide a unified perspective of um, relative shares of full open access journal publishing, delayed open access journal publishing, hybrid open access publishing, considering factors such as journal conversions as well as APC levels. So mixing in, you know, the kitchen sink into the data set so that we could try to, you know, gain more insight and maybe provide predictability for journals that are considering uh, flipping to open access as well. You know, how have similar cases fared uh, so far? And, you know, there's also an academic interest in just trying to understand how this phenomenon works. Uh, the methodology is pretty simple. You know, I, I tried to condense it into logos and catchphrases here. Uh, the universe of journals here is Scopus. It's not, you know, the total universe of open access journals or even subscription journals, but it's the most broad of the narrow indexes. So <clears throat> that's kind of the total universe of content we're considering here. And for defining open access for journals in Scopus, inclusion of journals in either the DOAJ or the ISSN organization's uh, road index is considered you know, an inclusion criteria. And I know a hidden gem, you know, I, I, I seem to find them all the time, but I think road is a hidden gem when it comes to providing another service for identifying open access journals in addition to DOAJ. But of course, road doesn't have the same stringent inclusion criteria as DOAJ, which is both a good and bad thing, you know, depending on what you want to use it for. Okay, this is really light, lightly shaded, but fortunately the black font still shows up, showing the ov overlap between articles included either only in DOAJ, only in Road, or then the overlap between them. And uh, the sample for this study for defining the open access journals was just shy of 3,500 full open access journals. And <clears throat> the 17,210 were then assumed to be subscription journals. And here, <clears throat> I've only included journals that published at least one document during 2016. So no zombie journals or, or stuff that, that wasn't active at the time of, of data collection. And of course, having this huge uh, task before me, knowing that I need to figure out quite a lot of things for 3,500 journals, I could scrape together some of our old data sets and uh, get information for, you know, a couple of hundred journals. We, we did a small exercise in, I think we collected the data in 2011, 2012 for journals which were then included in Scopus. But, you know, the world has changed since then, and there's not much you can uh, really use it for. So I had to visit most of these 3,500 websites to collect what I needed. Uh, we provided a small study on delayed open access earlier, so that was thrown into the mix just, just for posterity. And then uh, Heather Morrison and her team have published an, an open data set on APCs uh, in the MDPI journal data, which I happily imported into my, my data analysis, which saved some time in trying to <clears throat> retrieve particularly APC data for, for these journals. And the resources used here are free, they're not all open, but the Scopus title list is, and or at least was, publicly available. Road, DOAJ, likewise. And then the Schimago group provides an excellent service for retrieving article counts for journals included in Scopus. But you know, this is as academic as I'll get today, so <clears throat> this will be the last methodology slides. But then, figuring out when a journal has converted, or has it even converted to open access, that's, you know, a, pretty important question for doing something like this. And it can take five minutes and it can take, you know, almost an hour to figure out when a journal has converted, looking through editorials, looking through metadata found in the DOAJ or in Road, um, you know, whatever traces you can find to try to determine with some certainty that there's a specific year that the journal jumped over to publishing openly. And I wouldn't stand here today if the Internet Archive wouldn't, would exist, wouldn't exist and the Wayback Machine. You know, they, they store decades of snapshots of websites to my benefit for looking at how a journal website looked 10 years ago to see, you know, was it open or not and can I, can I gain some evidence. So I really love that service and Internet archaeology can be fun. Uh, but then... 
for what, what I'm here to kind of show you in very pre preliminary fashion, I haven't dug into discipline-specific trends or you know, publisher types or countries, but just showing you when journals in Scopus started OA publishing and through which mechanism. We can see that there's a huge you know, bulk of converted journals that already started <clears throat> publishing open access before the year 2000. Uh, there were also journals which had started uh, open access publishing at that time as well. But here, we have to re uh, remember that the Scopus inclusion provides some, I wouldn't say uncertainty to the modern era, shall we say the most recent years, because journals which are born open access take some time to f fulfill the Scopus inclusion criteria. So don't look too much on the, the, the most recent years, but we can see that there's a clear spike in born open access journals being founded you know, around year 2008 to 2012-ish you know, a boom that seemed to be decreasing, but I don't think that decrease is really as aggressive as it shows here, just due to the methodology used of using Scopus to, to explain it. But we see that journals have been converting pretty steadily. You know, there's no, uh, no huge spikes or, or dips there. And then twisting the data another way, just showing it cumulatively where we are today with regards to the balance of born open access journals or journals which have converted, I'd say that you know, the difference or the discre discrepancy between the categories has remained pretty much the same, that most of the journals have converted to open access from being subscription-based earlier. And <clears throat> there's been you know, a fairly, fairly balanced evolution when it comes to that. But then, throwing in APCs into the mix, uh, we see that most journals uh, in quantity are converted open access journals which ask, do not ask the authors for an APC. They might be sponsored by a society or an association, but the authors aren't supposed to pay anything. Uh, the second largest category is born open access journals asking for an APC, and then <clears throat> in the bottom we have the two, the two smaller, smaller categories of uh, born open access journals having no APC, and then APC asking converting journals. So, I don't know if this explains anything, but you know, it's nice, a nice diagram showing some of the differences. But then, looking at article counts uh, for these journals and how they have evolved, uh, I should have maybe separated mega journals from this because they explain quite a lot of the growth in born open access, uh, which ask for an APC, but they don't account for the whole share. There's quite a lot of large, uh, also specialized open access journals which have tremendous healthy uh, growth uh, and which constitute also a large part of the, the light, light blue block that you see here. But I would say that maybe, maybe it's not surprising, but you know, the development in the other categories, which are <clears throat> the three other ones, which are not born open access and APC bearing, hasn't been that dramatic. You know, it's been steadily increasing, but I'd say there's really nothing to write home about, at least yet. But then, <clears throat> I said I'd maybe not provide so much decision support for providing a competitive market for APCs, but maybe I can raise some questions or, or raise interest in you know, the pricing levels that we have. This is showing the journal spread of how journals distribute uh, on the spectrum in US dollars from $1 to, is it 3,500 plus? On the, on, the, on the end, where we can see that converted journals are fairly conservative in what they ask of authors. Uh, the categories with $500 or less are dominated by converted journals, and then almost for the rest of them, it's born open access journals asking for the higher amounts in higher quantities. But you know, this is just some initial perceptions. I haven't dug, dug into this since I, I finished the data collection this, almost the same day I submitted the slides, so we can't can't ask for too much at this stage, but <clears throat> looking at it from an article perspective, you know, in which, uh, at which APC levels are article published most, we can see that there's a much more even spread in uh, stuff being published in converted open access journals, uh, also in the more expensive end. But still, there's huge spikes by certain publishers having fairly fixed price points uh, that, you know, Skew, skew the distribution if we would count a mean or anything like that. So, <clears throat> but I think this is something I'd like to discuss. If you have 
questions or, or ideas for how we could kind of increase knowledge about how things are kind of developing uh, when it comes to pricing of uh, journals belonging to these different origin categories. And then since I promised to show you, you know, the development of open access in Scopus, I had to include this table, but uh, I think it's, it doesn't really contribute much compared to the, the two other studies I provided earlier, in that growth in open access uh, relative to subscription content has been at about 1% per year, both looked at through the journal lens as well as accounting for article counts. And it's currently about 17, 16%. And this is, maybe the novelty here is that these are adjusted for journal conversions. So uh, I have counted converted journals, subscription-based, up until the year they have jumped over and so forth. But, but I think this is already pretty known, that, that it's about a percent a year that open access is eating into uh, subscription-based content. But then, conclusions. Since I couldn't give you answers, I can you know, give some inspirational thoughts for how, how open access is, is doing. And as I said, a lot had changed since we collected the, the similar data sets that, that provided some of the ingoing data for this. So the shift towards open access is strong. There's like to completely new categories of, of journals since we collected data last. And, uh, you know, the five years have totally uh, changed the landscape. But one thing which I'd like to see improvement in is the amount of manual work required just to figure out the percentage or the status or the, what shall we say, the pulse of open access. So improvement in web services providing more direct insight so that, uh, you know, a summer wouldn't be needed for a person to, to figure out how open access is doing according to some benchmark. But I still think this was a bibliometric exercise, but I think a lot could be learned by listening and asking uh, converted journals for how they fared, you know, both of academic interest, but also of practical interest, to make the switch over to open access more predictable and manageable for journals which might feel that they are jumping into the void by, by uh, changing their, their publishing model. And then, after I completed my data collection, a, a new data set was published, which contains a neatly integrated data set of both road journals, DOAJ journals, as well as um, a PMC um, full content journals in a neat data set. So, it would have saved a lot of effort on my part, but I hope it can help others in the future who are interested in finding a as complete list of open access journals as possible that can then be cross-matched cross to, to various places. So I recommend looking up the data set by the Bielfeld University. And this analysis will continue as soon as I get home, looking at different publisher types, countries, uh, what have you. You know, this disciplines probably explains some part of the growth and can help in provide insight into where where the strongest open access growth has been coming from, and particularly are there certain uh, disciplines which have uh, converted journals that have certain tendencies, you know, for, for example, to increase their article output as soon as they con convert or, or things like that. You know, everything can, can be interesting that can be extracted from this. But that's basically it for me. Thanks for, for listening, and I really enjoyed my stay here. Thanks. Yes, I'm Colleen Campbell. Um, I'm really thrilled to be at the first COASP meeting of my life. Um, I lead, indeed, partner development in the OA 2020 initiative, which is coordinated by the Max Planck Digital Library. Um, they are based in Munich, um, but it is the central digital library for over 80 institutes in the Max Planck Society, one of the most important research organizations in the world. Um, I, I mentioned the offices are in Munich, but I actually work from home, which is here. And I, looking at the news last night, I just saw this um, on The Guardian. Theresa May is also on her way to Florence uh, to talk about what should the transition look like. I thought that was rather serendipitous that she's also considering this question, just like we all are. Um, so what should the transition look like? 
From the Open Access 2020 perspective, um, we, we, we have our ideas and um, Paul shared a few of, uh, of them with you. We are, though, here at COASP, what I've really, um, what's been really exciting for me is to see how we are all working toward a way. It was so interesting to see so many facets to the question, um, technology, policy, um, different aspects of publishing. But as I was listening to everything, um, I, I was afraid I was getting that sinking feeling that I had, again, harping back to Brexit and that vote. I was in London at the time of that vote and or when the, the US presidential elections were happening and I went to bed um, quite happily um, confident of a certain result and then woke up to a great surprise the day after. And, and so the, the, the connection is here we're talking all about open access publishing but there's a huge thing out there that we need to address, right? That I, you know, with the elections, I had really gotten clear that there was that other entity out there. So, as an introduction to Open Access 2020, um, I'd like to share our mission here. You see, it's a global alliance committed to accelerating the transition to today's scholarly journals to open access. We collaborate to transform the current publishing system, replacing the subscription business model with new models that ensure outputs are open and reusable, and that the costs behind their dissemination are transparent and economically sustainable. So, um, we work in tandem with other open access initiatives, but our focus specifically is to address the bulk of scholarly journals, which is, as we saw from um, the data that Michael showed right now, is still locked behind paywalls. How do we do that? Well, the um, basic concept is through collective action. You see here um, just some national entities that have endorsed the OA 2020 initiative. Um, I think the point is, really, what, what wields power today? Unfortunately, <laughs> It's still money. Money wields power. And so if I look at these entities, just as I said, as an example, and think about the economic weight of these entities, um, this is something that I think that we can use to face publishers at eye level. Uh, we need a global initiative to face publishing, which is global. On the institutional level, or within a library consortium, for example, or a national consortium, this happens through creating individual roadmaps, using subscription budgets as leverage, and systematically reorganizing budgets to divest of subscriptions and invest in open access. That's really what it's all about. Divest of subscriptions, invest in open access. Um, indeed, this panel was, has a focus on APCs, but I wanted to clarify that that's not what OA 2020 is really all about. I mean, we are open to any number of business models. Um, and I'm happy to say we are gaining in momentum. Just yesterday we had news that the Academic Council of UC Merced voted to endorse OA 2020. So we now have um, yeah, scores of, of organizations and representing hundreds of institutions. So how do we prepare for this, getting back to the topic, how do we prepare for this transition? What is the starting point for creating a roadmap um, to create a strategy to shift funding to open access? Well, um, for a library, the, first, the starting point is to get your arms around publishing, the publishing that's happening, the gold away publishing that's happening, and to understand the significance of the open access publishing um, that's happening. Libraries right now have, uh, uh, they're focused on, on their budgets, they're focused on their subscriptions, and it's hard for them to see the bigger picture. But this is what we invite them to do, because uh, they need to gather data, they need to understand um, their publishing trends of their institution, the distribution of publishers across um, the publication, the outputs that are coming out, the share of corresponding authors of, of their outputs in addition to the finances, which they pretty much have a handle on. So taken on an individual level, at the Max Planck Digital Library specifically, um, this is how we have assessed the leverage power that we have. Um, we looked at all of the, the outputs of the Max Planck Society and um, understood that about 80% of our institutional outputs 
are actually being published in journals by just 20 publishers. And if we look closer at who these publishers are, we see that five of these are already gold open access um, publishers. So I think, that's, um, I think that's good news for this community. And this is something, we've done data analyses um, for other, for countries, for, for institutions, and we see that this trend is consistent. So gold open access publishing is growing. Um, this is something, however, that libraries are not really aware of. So we, we have to in, in, engage them in, in, in convincing them to do these data analyses to, to, understand, to understand the publishing trends. And I'll get to why that's important in a moment. So looking even further into the data, the publications from our researchers, these are, this is the development across time and the distribution um, among publishers. You see at the bottom the big three subscription publishers that you can imagine who they might be. And up at the top, the gold bars you're seeing are um, gold open access publications, pure gold open access publications. Now what does this tell me? Um, this, if I were a librarian, what it would tell me is, hmm, what is the value that publishers are bringing me today? If I look at um, this, the, the, the big three, it's, it's a rather flat line, isn't it? Whereas gold open access publishing is growing. My researchers are choosing to publish in gold OA journals. This is an important thing to know because um, when I receive a subscription renewal offer from a subscription publisher and I look at the cost and I'm presented with counter statistics and how important those journals are and the usage, the high usage and um, you know, return on investment, well, I need to think about other metrics to really understand the value that my researchers pl place on these journals. It goes beyond usage goes to publication. Where do they choose to publish? Where do they choose, what journals are they citing, for example? So with that information, um, then libraries can create an action plan, um, engage in different ways to divest of their subscriptions. I said before, it's not just um, uh, going with a, an offset modeler or APCs, and we'll talk about offsets in a moment. But uh, it could be any number of strategies to divest of subscriptions. Stepwise reduction, a certain percentage a year, engaging um, in cancellations of big deals, going at de digging deeper into the data to understand what individual journals are truly valuable. And engaging, yes, in transformative agreements. Then um, creating a strategy to invest in open access. So that means supporting pure open access publishers and journals supporting open access initiatives like Scope 3, a very successful example. We have Fair OA, Lingoa, um, Math OA, SciPost, Knowledge Unlatched, Open Library of the Humanities, building your own community publishing platforms. But um, by, by divesting of subscriptions and taking those funds and um, shifting them to open access, um, that is truly the strategy that we are looking at. What does this mean for the open access publishers here? Well, Paul, um, both today and a few months back, as he mentioned, had, uh, it came to the Berlin Open Access Conference and posed a few questions to us. Um, and he's reiterated them here. So I, I, can under, I, I want you to know, I understand this pain. And, and I think we actually have um, uh, a lot of alignment. The big challenges are with um, hybrid publication. And there are challenges with offsetting models. Um, but we need to get getting back to the numbers, and um, we've had even more numbers to look at uh, in, in both presentations. But the, the financial data behind the transformation that OA2020 is proposing was published in the MPDL white paper of 2015, showing that there is already enough money in the subscription system to transfer to open access publishing. The key now is to tap into that. So if we saw that based on subscriptions, an individual article has a cost of 3,800 euro, 
turning things around based on the empirical evidence that we have on APCs, we can see that 2,000 euro is really more of a realistic cost for an estimate, a, a high estimate of actual publication cost of a journal. Multiply that by the two million article, articles that are published a year, and you see up there at the top that we would actually have quite a large buffer to be invested in open access publishing initiatives, pure open access publishers. And that's what we're going for, is creating, um, creating the conditions to get to that sweet spot. So um, I'm gonna share with you some more numbers. If you wanna tweet something, this is, <laughs> this is the interesting thing to tweet. Um, looking at the cost of pure gold OA publishing, I mean, we, we did this exercise because we wanted to make sure, we wanted to test our numbers, the numbers presented in the white paper. And this is data gathered directly from publisher websites in the past uh, year or so, um, looking at the, the, the cost of APCs. And you see, um, we were estimating, where you see there in red was you know, the estimate based on the subscription cost of, uh, of an article, an individual article. But what we see actually is that, you know, the majority of, of, of journals, and here we, we've, we've looked at some representative journals, um, very well respected in their field, and looked at the APCs of that cluster there, that cluster there is right around 1,300 euro. So we're, we're pretty confident that the numbers are there, that this, um, we can arrive at that buffer that we need to support OA publishing. If we compare that to the cost of hybrid journals, um, yes, absolutely right. The hybrid costs are higher. But I would say that from our perspective, at least from the Max Planck Digital Library perspective, hybrid publishing is not gold open access publishing. And I think that's where we need to focus um, uh, we need to focus on that. I mean, we've, we've learned lessons I, from the UK experience. Um, in Germany, we, there was a different tack was taken. Certainly a transition, there, there's, in any transition, there's some level of an investment that is required. So in Germany, um, the, the uh, DFG did create a fund to support publication of pure open access um, articles with a, a, a limit of 2,000 euro, with, the, with a, a specific plan. Institutions had to commit that they wanted to use this um, funds for publication in pure OA journals. They wanted to scale down that funding over time. It was created to give institutions the time necessary to organize new funding schemes. So I think this is more of a, of a, um, of a model that could be um, more useful in, in creating the conditions necessary to shift to a pure open access world. So in, in response to Paul's um, concerns around offset agreements, first of all, I'd like to clarify, we would consider these, yes, transitional agreements. They are meant to pave the way to um, pure open access. The offset agreements that, that you saw, with the exception of the, the, the UK example, um, the offset agreements that you're seeing in, in, in Europe right now, they are sort of an evolutionary response. So with the lessons learned in the UK, the next step, um, we're going to have a, a different kind of framework. The idea is to combine under one license agreement both the read access component and publishing services into one agreement. This allows the institutions and the publishers to create a, a new logic. Um, it's sort of a bridge. Uh, if you think about, <laughs> silly example, but uh, the hybrid car, right? It's not like right now we, we, we talk about um, self-driving cars, but before we got to that point, we had a hybrid car and we had electric cars and you have to pass through certain um, stages in, in order to get to that point. We need to create the conditions for both institutions and publishers to test, uh, to create new workflows and to test them. So what are the opportunities um, for a, a new pure open access scenario? What, what opportunities does, uh, is, are on the horizon? First of all, I would, uh, I think that we have, as I was mentioning just now, um, the opportunity to use these transitional models 
uh, as um, testing ground to develop um, the new efficiencies. So centralized agreements, absolutely, absolutely. We do need to do more with um, centralized agreements, um, both for offset agreements and for pure OA publishers. If we could um, collaborate on creating, I, there was some discussion earlier, um, decide on some standards um, for pure OA publishers, for example, metadata standards to help streamline processes. I think in, in at the Max Planck Digital Library, we have a, a requirement that um, the funding information be provided in metadata. And that's, I mean, that's just one. So there are, are things that we can collaborate on, um, libraries and pure OA publishers, to create better workflows. Pre-radical invoicing is another. I mean, on, on our side, it makes things easier. On your side, payment comes faster. So I think that's a win-win situation. Um, the the ESAC initiative, I think um, Paul's presentation um, quoted it. I invite you to go there and have a look or, and perhaps get involved. Um, it is an initiative that involves both publishers and libraries to define the workflows that are necessary to work through transitional agreements with an eye to the future. But there are also um, economic benefits uh, working through. So I think we hear, it, it's the point, we are open access publishers and OA 2020, we are aligned in that we are looking for um, the way to create the conditions to, to get to those funds that are right now locked up in big deals that are locked up in subscriptions. And the other key is, of course, transparency, because transparency is what is going to drive competition. Um, right now, Bo Christer Bjork um, has published an article recently about the, 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 the deadlock that publishing is in right now, subscription publishing is in, because there's not enough competition in the market currently. And to one of the keys to that is, in fact, the lack of transparency in pricing. So the more we can push to cost transparency, we're going to increase the competition, which ultimately is going to create a better scenario, create opportunities to, um, for innovation. And I wanted to mention, I don't know if you're all familiar with this or not, the Open APC initiative. Um, all our, uh, we invite everyone, it, it's a, an initiative uh, supported by the INTAC project in Germany, and um, institutions are invited to upload their APC data, and so in this way we can track the APC costs and share that information and have a good set of data then to analyze and learn from. So, I mean, to summarize, I would say, yes, we are um, very much in, in a phase of transition. I understand and we feel as well the pain points of offset models, but they are transitional models and we need to push through. We have momentum going and we just need to move beyond it. So here I would um, invite you all to collaborate. Um, the third principle in, our, our, in, in the OA 2020 expression of interest, you cited the first two, Paul, but you didn't cite the third, which is, um, we want to, we invite the entire community of scholarly communications to come together and discuss this, to, uh, to discuss new business models. Francis Pinter cited a few um, different payment models that we could think about adopting besides APCs. But I think what the key here is, is collaboration. So together, um, looking beyond this transitional phase and moving toward a moment where Library expenditures will be liberated from subscriptions, and we can have transparency. I say, let's all work together to unplug the system. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to ask Paul a follow-up question about offsetting, because I have a lot of the same qualms about it and agree that transparency is absolutely essential. Um, but in the U.S., I have this odd situation where, you know, we subscribe at the library to journals and also provide OA funds that are limited to non-hybrid journals. But that doesn't stop authors from paying the APCs. We're seeing significant numbers of authors independently paying these fees. And, and 
So the cost of the institution has gone up quite a bit, not to the library, but you know, the overall cost. So, so I'm in kind of a bind because I, I could negotiate an offsetting agreement with the publishers that would bring that cost back down to at least only what I pay. Um, or I can kind of let, the, let this happen and let authors continue to pay these rather high APCs. I think they view it as kind of like the equivalent of knowledge unlatched for articles, right? So they're, they're paying to release their article for OA and they see that as a good thing. And they're not looking at the whole system. And you know, in the US, we really can't tell authors what to do. They're free agents. So there, a lot of these APCs are being funded by themselves with their own research funds, not even a grant. So I'm really not sure you know, what the right solution there is to achieve transparency, but maintain costs so that the taxpayers and students aren't paying even more than today. Is this on? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a great solution for what this new payment model would look like or what the, 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 the perfect thing is. I think in the early days of open access, when we thought about how this market would work, there was this maybe idealistic view that the cost of publication would be like any other cost that's part of the research process. And people don't have meetings like this to discuss the cost of beakers and airplane tickets to go to conferences and things like that because there are natural market incentives that make the person paying care about how much they're paying and assess value for money in all these, these areas. And I think we sort of naively felt that this is how the market's going to evolve. And there's a few things that made that challenging. I think one is that from an author's point of view, what they were getting publishing in an open access journal was very similar to what they were getting publishing in a subscription journal. And so there was sort of this free alternative. And it's really difficult to then have a, a functioning price mechanism where there's a perceived free alternative that in many cases is more prestigious, um, more attractive in other ways. And then a separate issue, which I, again, don't think there's any great solution to um, that preserves the market mechanism is that there are fields where there's just not that much money in, in the, the research funding process. And social sciences and humanities and developing countries and all these areas are parts where I think the idealistic view is not going to work. But what I worry about is that over the past few years we've moved further and further away from this ideal where, I mean, again, I do think a researcher who sees two equivalent journals, one of which is $2,000, one of which is $1,000, has some incentive to publish in the $1,000 journal. And as we remove them from the payment process, I, I just think that whole mechanism is, is, is getting distorted. Um, a question for Colleen. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk, and I definitely am more in agreement with you that I think the offsetting models can be a trans transition, and actually the hybrid model itself definitely has its flaws, but when done right, it can be a transition, and we are definitely seeing that in, in some areas anyway. Um, I was interested when you said about institutions preparing for OA 2020, and one of the things that they should do is understand the significance of their data and, and gathering that. I definitely have felt that that's something that's quite hard for them to do, and do you think that publishers should have a role in helping this? Well, um, sure. <laughs> I think um, I'm not. I'm trying to think of like from a technology perspective or from data. Where does that data would come from? I mean, we have some data ourselves. We've had we've had to acquire it and and slice and dice it. And there are services that do this. I mean, these services are expensive, of course, because it's a huge job. But I think it would be wonderful if we could create some. Open APC thing that instead we're <laughs> you sort of like GitHub something that would, if publishers, I, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a technology person, but that would be brilliant if we could create something like that. Um, yeah, I, do, I think it's important and to the part where I do agree with Paul in that I think there is a challenge that if we're just repurposing library budgets, we're not pulling together all of the the funds in the system and so we're not pulling together money that's already being used for fully open access journals and I think if publishers and institutions can work together and kind of saying this is how much you're actually already spending on open access that you don't know and then institutions can maybe work at trying to pull together all of those funds I think mm -hmm. that might help the pure OA publishers. 
Yeah, yeah. I think I mean I know that in the the discussions I've had with libraries, they would always say, you know, well, we ask the publisher if they could tell us how much, and of course, you know, the publishers are not helpful in that at all. But it's, I mean, as as far as the OE twenty twenty initiative is, we one thing we're trying to do is educate librarians to to help them understand what kind of data analyses need to be done. At least that's a first step, I think. Um, I, I've got two questions, if possible. Um, one is, is for Michael. So you showed an interesting graph where the APCs of the converted journals were in general lower than the, the born OA. And I was uh, wondering whether you had the data to see if subsequent to their launch, the prices rose to become more in line with the born OA journals. And my thinking behind this is, is whether when you convert a journal, the worry is that your sub submissions will go down and your authors will, will essentially walk out the door. So you try and benchmark your APC at a lower price that looks more competitive? Um, um. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have longitudinal data. But from what I could see, based on the earlier data sets, that I had rarely had to correct an APC downwards from where there was one before, that there was always an increase <laughs> of APCs. Up. And of course, uh, both born open access journals and probably converted journals are free or heavily discounted yeah. at the start just to get... Uh, yeah. And also on that graph, whether um, if you put the publisher identity on the Born OA journals, would that um, cluster, do you think? I, I do think so, because uh, I, I got wise to the tricks of publishers on like finding out ways to, to see when they have converted, because some of them change licenses res retrospectively and some, you know, they do it in different ways, but, but I, I do think that uh, the publisher uh, clustering can explain quite a lot about the patterns that can be found. And, and a question uh, for, for Paul as well is that um, if there is wholesale conversion and the few large publishers flip to OA, um, if they're providing a service, does it matter, really, if the pure OA publishers go out of business? I mean, in, in the larger scheme of things, really, does it matter? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly self-interested in wanting born pure OA publishers to succeed. I, I work for one. But I think more importantly than that, having an ecosystem where new entrants can come and compete is necessary in any market. And so I think the real concern is whether, you know, the new world has space for someone like a Kinawi or whatever, that, that's not important for, for scholarship. What is important for scholarship is that there is an ecosystem where the services needed to be provided by commercial entities are competitive, are transparent, and there's you know both price competition and opportunities for new entrants to come in. Hello, uh, Philip Purnell from Knowledge in Dubai. My question is for um, Mikhail. I wanted to know whether you had done any studies on citation uh, data, so indicators in Scopus like CiteScore, to see if there's any relationship between the open access model and how much they're being cited. Uh, well, that's of course a field that gets quite a lot of publications, you know, the citation advantage of open access, and it's not something I've been really that interested in myself, unfortunately, since I think there are quite good studies that, you know, prove that open access uh, at least has no disadvantage to citations, but probably also has an advantage, if I may be diplomatic here. But, but uh, no, I haven't really looked into it. And of course, it's very hard to control for self-selection bias. And you know, two journals or two articles are rarely alike. But of course, you can control for various factors. But um, it's an interesting aspect, but not something I've looked into personally. Good, all right, well, perhaps you could uh, join me in thanking the speakers again. Thank you.